let's start with some of the you know, observed phenomenon of these ET craft. You know, uh, if you go to uh, SeriousDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com, so at SeriousDisclosure.com we have five, six dozen military witnesses testimony up there. We have the Orion Project links to all these sort of papers, but there's a lot of information from these witnesses of things that they observed, such as pilots who'd be flying along and there would be a spacecraft off their wing and it didn't just fly off, it dematerialized, quote unquote, instantly right there on, on radar and just vanished. Well, it's not like they were hallucinating because it was on radar and ground radar and onboard radar. This is what happened also, by the way, with the famous Alaska case where the Japan Airlines 747 Heavy was flying to polar route from Paris to Tokyo carrying champagne and whatever else they carry on cargo jets uh, from Paris. Um, and they had this massive spacecraft appear. And it was the size of a battleship, but it was in the sky. And it actually was a CE-5 in the sense that the pilot signaled to it, put the, the landing lights on, and the craft signaled back. So there was, there was contact. A lot of people don't know that. You read the case of the captain, the Japan Airlines captain's account. Well, the, the, the spaceship, and this is all on our site and in the book Disclosure, the captain called in, it had it on its radar, and called it in, and of course it ended up being on FAA radar, which we eventually, from John Callan, got the FAA tapes, and also a military radar. Military jets were scrambled. But this massive object did not move in a linear way. What do I mean by that? Well, it would be, say, at 12 o'clock, and instantly it would then be at 6 o'clock. This is something that was many times the size of 747. And it moved in this nonlinear way. And they could not understand it. First, they thought the radar was malfunctioning. That's what you go to immediately. Because, you know, normally you track, even if you're tracking, you know, a B-2 stealth or something that's supersonic, you're tr it's very linear. I mean, even four times the speed of sound is pretty slow. Or the space shuttle at 25,000 miles per hour is pretty slow. And track that thing. This is not trackable. <laughs> so in a linear way, because it would be here and then here. How? I'll get to this. And oh, by the way, the same thing happened. Merle Shane McDowell, who's one of our witnesses, who was down here in Virginia at Norfolk at uh, Atlantic Command, and he was working under the Sink Atlantic Command, the Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Command, Admiral Harry Train. And they had a full, what's called full zebra alert, where basically, if you don't have a zebra stripe on your badge, you got to get out of the command center within 60 seconds or you're shot by the Marines who have the M16s there to enforce that. Now, I've been at this facility and in that area, and they, they mean business when you're in there. And so they went to full zebra alert, the Admiral came down into his observation area and this, this is huge facility, and they had this ET craft on radar off the coast of Newfoundland. Boom, one radar sweep. It'd be off the coast of South Florida. <laughs> one radar sweep, boom, it'd be right off the coast of Norfolk. And then it went off over to the Canary Islands, et cetera, and so on. They actually did scramble jets when it was in one area, I think up in the Northeast, and got close enough to take photos. All the photos got classified and put into the Black Pit of Calcutta, um, never to be seen again. But daytime, there's a daytime event. But the movement on the radar clearly showed that it was this very large, it's several hundred feet, they estimate maybe the size of a football field, circular object, and that's how it was moving. Now, this is not your granddad's Oldsmobile. Clearly not using a jet engine or a rocket or anything like that. So, you know, people say, what are the cases where you have proof of this? I said, well, we have the observation, we have the radar tapes, we have the documents, we have, what do you want? You know, but the, 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 what's behind the phenomenon is stop for a minute and say, how is it doing this? Well, it gets into what Einstein called the spooky effect. Everybody know what spooky effect is? Well, Einstein observed that a particle could be in two places at once, like that. 
the same thing. And so he couldn't really explain it, but he just called it spooky, <laughs> the spooky effect. And I guess it was spooky if you were linear in your thinking and teleologic and Einsteinian, but it's not spooky when you think about it. The whole cosmos is actually non-local because it's conscious. A few years ago, there was a journal, a physics journal that published, and it was actually on the front page of Newsweek. This was back in the late 80s, early 90s, where they did a study. And what they were doing is that they were studying photons and shooting them down uh, 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 an area, and they were, there would be an aperture or a window that it would go through. But what happened is that the physicists found that when they thought of where they were going to move, the photons changed course precognitively. In other words, the photons reacted with the thought and consciousness and intent of the physicists. And this was done over and over again and proven. And this was published in mainstream physics journals. But people say, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, I don't know what it means. They chucked it aside. Again, it's the cool stuff that gets chucked aside. This is in the mainstream physics journals. You look this study up. And then, of course, you have people like Dr. Bob John of Princeton, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, the Peer Lab. And back in the 90s, he and I spoke about this. He says, you know what you're doing out under the stars is, is sort of in a clinical, you know, experiential way what I'm proving in the lab. And that is that everything is conscious and everything can react to thought and consciousness. And so what he did at, at Princeton, he was Professor Emeritus of Engineering, and some of his work has been continued by some of his, his students, is that he would uh, have like a random number generator, like a, a, a machine that just generates you know, zeros and ones or something like that. And they'd have someone just sit and it wasn't like this was some psychic or, you know, somebody, it just ordinary people, and they would put their intention on it that it would, instead of putting out zeros, would put out more ones. And sure enough, the bell curve distribution would shift. Now, or the other way. But what was really cool about it, he then found that if there were two people who were really connected to each other, loved each other, where there was a heart connection, and did it together, the effect was exponential, 10 times greater. So what is that? And this, was, this is a mechanical system. It's just a thing spitting out zero in the random number generator. And this has been proven over and over and over and over and over again. Now, there's no linear contact between the person's body, the physical, 3D, 4D, and the machine. It's just purely thought intending, and yet it affects it. What does this mean? Well, it means that everything is awake. Everything has within its structure an element of this non-local consciousness, mind that isn't bound to 3D space-time. And so non-locality is something that began to be talked about by physicists and then there's a medical doctor, a man that I got actually met once and he wrote a wonderful book called um, Recovering the Soul and it was all these accounts of, of, of scientists and also lay people finding that the mind and thought was always an omnipresent field and could have effects whether it was like an intercessionary prayer for someone, you know, one person would be in Europe, the other person in Hawaii, and they would have an effect, et cetera, and so on. Or they would take uh, saliva, which has, you know, your white blood cells in it, and they take it, you know, to another continent, keep it alive in a Petri dish, and they would put electrodes, and th those white blood cells would register when the person had an emotional reaction to something consistently, even though it was out of their body. I mean, this is the really cool stuff. So, if you, is everybody understanding this? You know, I haven't lost too many people yet. And what that means, the real kind of the bullet point is, the mind is always omnipresent. Your mind, my mind, all mind, because there's a singularity of mind. Erwin Schrodinger, the father of 
uh, modern uh, quantum, quantum mechanics, it was really particle wave theory back, I think it was 1908, said um, the total number of minds in the universe is one. That is, it's a singularity. So mind stuff or consciousness is a singularity. Now, we can be aware of our own awareness and think, well, I'm conscious and I'm Steve, and you attach it to yourself and your ego or your, your individuation, let's call it, your individuality. However, it's always at the same time on a, uh, uh, without any effort, whether you know it or not, tied into this sort of omnipresent, non-local field of consciousness, as it turns out, without effort. Now, you can be shut off from that or you can be tied into it. The meditative state and samadhi is when you get tied into the universal component. That's all meditation is. It's the quieting of the individual mind to where you experience the non-local mind, the, the unbounded mind. And this actually has profound implications not only for health and healing and contact, as we'll get to, but in physics. Because if you look at the cosmos, everything is in fact consciousness phasing and resonating as a photon or a star or a person or an individual or a tree. Now this is not pantheism, it's an understanding that's a transcendent understanding of this sort of universality of the awake state, the, the awareness. And this has been proven scientifically. This is not, there have been study after study after study, some of which I'm citing here. I don't want to belabor the point. You can look these up yourselves. I'm sure you can all know how to read. Um, but I want to pull it together into sort of a, a, a sort of a, a, an awakening within yourself of the fact that you're just not limited to your physical body and self, even when you think you are.